So the big news yesterday that a lot of folks are talking about involves intercollegiate athletics and decision at the Board of Governors level to take steps going forward supporting rule changes for student athletes to receive compensation for third party endorsements related and separate from athletics. So social media, signings at car dealerships, those types of things, compensation for those will now be allowed for players if everything is passed and it wouldn't go into effect until the fall of 2021 in about 16 months where student athletes can identify themselves say hi i'm Tua Tango Vailoa from Alabama but not use an Alabama logo or an SEC logo and at no point would the university or college be directly involved in this conversation with the name image and likeness obviously it's a big move for the NCA and it opens up a bunch of questions and we are really pleased to be joined by the president of the NCA Dr. Mark Emmert, before we get into the, the important stuff, the real important stuff, uh, how are you? How's your family? How are things going for the leadership at the NCAA? You know, thanks for asking, Mike. Uh, really, everybody's in my uh, family's doing fine. Everybody's healthy, happy, still employed. So, you know, <laughs> those are the basics today, obviously. Uh, I've been incredibly impressed with all my staff. We're all working from home, of course, like everybody is. And uh, making some making some important uh, decisions, obviously, as you were just mentioning at the top of the hour, working with all of the member schools and trying to figure out how to operate in this strange new world and and how to do it with a heck of a lot less money. You know, we lost lost uh, our largest revenue supply uh, to the NCA, and and so we we had to reduce our budget a little over forty five percent from a budget cut and. Everybody's taking salary cuts or freezes. So, but you know, we're working through that like everybody is, and that's that's our job. Just you, the other executives, twenty percent pay cut as part of this. We'll get into the COVID nineteen impacts and some other things in a bit later in our conversation. Let's start with the name, image, and likeness um, mountain that was moved in the minds of some yesterday. You've been on this job since 2010, and you've said early in your tenure, we don't pay student athletes. Athletes will not be compensated. But as we've seen with this pandemic, the world changes. Things change. So why is change in this regard with name, image, and likeness the right thing right now? Well, first of all, uh, I've been doing this almost a decade now, which is kind of hard to imagine. But uh, you know, over that time frame uh, and and well before that, uh, the, the the fundamental principle around which college sports is organized hasn't changed at all, and that's the notion that student students who play sports, college athletes, uh, are not employees of universities. They're not uh, playing the game for a paycheck. They're playing it as part of their experiences being a student at a university. And, and this change uh, doesn't alter that fundamental core principle. And, and, and I'm excited about this, by the way. I think it's going to be a very positive shift for all kinds of reasons. But one of the things that has changed most dramatically during that 10-year period, and, and you've sure seen it in, in your world, Mike, is, is the movement from uh, traditional broadcast and traditional ways of engaging around marketing to, to social media and, and the rise of of social media influencers and that we that we measure the impact that an individual has by the number of Twitter followers they have or other metrics uh, that largely did not exist even just 10 years ago. So we now have a space where young men, young women are showing up uh, to colleges with a significant social media presence with sig already being influencers, already having a following that people in the advertising world and the endorsement world uh, want to be engaged with. So as we've spent the past over, over a year now exploring what we could do in this arena and what the schools would be supportive of while still maintaining the, the mm -hmm. basic principles of what is a student athlete and, and what does it mean to be compensated to be an athlete uh, in a collegiate setting, it became more and more reasonable and people's comfort level rose. Still a lot of unanswered questions, still a lot of work to do over the next nine months before any of this becomes a permanent part of NCAA rules. But we're in a, we're in a much better space today than we were uh, just a few days ago. And just for that timeline, each division one, two, and three will have to put up some guardrails, some guidelines, if you will, by Halloween, then voted on January of 2021. And if those two steps are hit, 
then this becomes part of NCAA rules and law uh, come the football season, if you will, the fall semester of 2021. To those guardrails, just on the surface, how can you keep this from seeping into recruiting, which then goes back to essentially the schools are compensating athletes to come to play? Yeah, it's the biggest challenge, obviously, and, and nobody's naive about this. Uh, you know, I've worked in higher ed for 40 years in, in every, pretty much every region of the country, and I've seen lots of permutations of, of how this all plays out. Uh, what we can do and what will, will be done is that the, the individual divisions, and so your audience knows, by the way, all of the NCAA rules, whether you love them or hate them, all of the NCAA right. rules are made by the schools themselves, not by me, not by my staff. The schools have to come together and decide what those rules are going to be. In this case, what the, the guardrails are going to be around protecting the integrity of the games. Uh, there's a lot to be explored here. There's a lot of discussion about whether or not there, there could or should be a third party entity put in place that can assess and become a clearinghouse, if you will, not, not my office, not my people, to determine whether or not a deal, uh, a sponsorship deal looks, looks legitimate or not. Uh, and then by doing it in a, in a public sphere where the, both sides of the relationship are, are disclosed, you can also see who's supporting that deal and whether or not they're affiliated with a school or not. Um, that's that's going to be complicated and tricky. But, you know, today, if you if you go to people again in your business and the, the, on the marketing side of it and say, well, what's a, an appropriate mm -hmm. uh, value for a, a local car dealership marketing arrangement, for example, we all like to talk about that. And, and you can put some parameters around it. Right. If a deal comes in and it's 10x of that, well, then you say, gee, that that maybe doesn't look right, and then you look into it. Uh, will it be will it be people that can manipulate it? Uh, sure. Are we going to have to make adjustments over time? Of course. But despite the fact that it's hard and it's complicated, it's still the right thing to do, and and we're going to have to slog our way through it and figure out how to make those guardrails work over the next handful of years. Yeah, Dr. Emmer, a lot of the rules in the NCA manual are because people found ways to skirt the rules and, and break the law, <laughs> if, if you will. And agents are a significant part of that equation. And in the language of yesterday, it pointed out that players can retain a representative to deal with some of these matters. You've worked, uh, the NCA, not you, has, and the member institutions have worked so hard to keep agents out of this atmosphere. Now they're being invited in. Is there any possible way to put up a wall and say, you can help with this, but you can't help with the other stuff? Yeah, well, we do that right now, of course, uh, around a number of sports. <clears throat> I know you, you were chatting about hockey just a minute ago. We, we have the same issues there and in baseball. Mm -hmm. And we, we have those kind of guidelines in place. Again, nobody's naive enough to think that that works perfectly. It, it doesn't, but it works reasonably well. And, and I think by moving these kinds of arrangements uh, to where they're, they're public engagements, right? So you, you have to uh, state and, and declare that, okay, I'm, I'm a student, uh, a high school student, let's say, and I'm moving into this institution and, and here's a sponsorship arrangement or speaking engagement or whatever the, or I'm, I'm, I'm trying to monetize a, a book I wrote or a music that I do or whatever the product is. Uh, then by, by moving it into the daylight, you, you have a much better chance of saying, okay, we know what that arrangement is. We can assess whether or not this was about trying to get somebody to attend a specific school or is because that, that um, uh, organization that's paying for the sponsorship actually values that person because of their endorsement deal and it has real merit. The role of agents then, or advisors, or they, they may not be agents. They, there's a lot of things that, that kids need to think about. They need to think about the tax implications. They need, to, they need to think about whether or not this will make them not eligible for a Pell Grant anymore because it'll be legitimate income. It changes their financial status, not with the school, but you know, in terms of the IRS. And, and a lot of young people in particular you know, haven't ever dealt with that. They're gonna need professional advice. They're going to need somebody to help them think whether or not this is fair market value from their point of view or if somebody's uh, undervaluing it. So getting that kind of advice makes great sense. 
having somebody use this as a as a brokerage arrangement with a school to go to a particular school that's where the NCA is going to have to step in and say no 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 wait a minute we we're fine with you getting reimbursed to do a, a sponsorship deal uh, here but that can't be part of an inducement to get you to attend a specific school that's going to be the tricky part and uh, we have that's why we have 9 months to right. think that through and figure out how to put guardrails up let me ask you about Washington, D.C. Congress was mentioned in this uh, in some way, shape or form. What the Board of Governors and the approval of this working list led to says essentially we want the federal government to come up with umbrella legislation. So it's not state by state. And there's a simple reason why state by state. Then we're going to have impossible recruiting situations because you're recruiting in one state with different rules. And that would blow the equity and the fairness. What is your feeling about getting Congress involved and having success having Congress involved in this portion of the NCAA's business? Well, I, I think it's fair to say that, that college sports, uh, sports in general, but college sports in particular for more than 100 years now have done remarkably well, been incredibly successful, despite the fact that there's no you know, federal sports agency, that's, that's not the kind of thing we typically do in the United States. Uh, but we've now reached a place where there's enough uh, governmental uh, engagement uh, around each of the states that we simply have to have Congress become involved. You can't, you can't run a sports system, as you pointed out, with 50 different sets of rules um, out there. And, and we've already got two states with slightly different laws. We've got several more that are keyed up to pass rules, all of which look a little bit different. Uh, that, that doesn't work if you want to have anything like fair national championships. And, and that's the most important part of, of college sports is the, the fairness of those championships. And so we have to get Congress to help us there. Similarly, we're, we're in a curious place where uh, sort of no good deed goes unpunished. Whenever there's been uh, significant mm -hmm. rule changes by the schools to provide more support for students or more liberalization of rules in one place, that's often followed by a, a trail of, of, of lawsuits. Uh, it, you know, that's, that's very difficult for sc the schools to, to manage uh, and for the association to manage Surely we'd like to find uh, a way to engage in this particular relationship uh, in a way that doesn't immediately lead to that, that same trail of, of lawsuits, if it's possible, and to be done in, an, in a way that works for all the parties involved. Uh, I've had a lot of conversations with members of Congress. Um, commissioners have, university presidents mm -hmm. most importantly have. Uh, there's there's deep interest in this. Uh, it's you know everybody loves college sports. Everybody's got an interest in this, and it crosses the 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 country. You know whether it's a a small sports market or a big sports market. Everybody wants college sports to be successful. Everybody wants their alma mater to be able to engage in these activities because it's fun. It's great for kids, uh, and we want it to persevere. But everybody's also got lots of different ideas about how to do that. Uh, do I think we can get something done? Yeah, I do. Uh, that's not to minimize the challenges of getting anything passed in Congress. Getting it done right now with the mm -hmm. pandemic going on, with an election year coming, this is all a big heavy lift. Uh, again, nobody's naive about the challenges here. But, you know, it's important that we, that we do that and, and we really need their help and support. And, and we're going to continue to engage with them. Uh, through all of our member schools, because that's the, the way to do this. We've about a minute or so left in this segment, and then we're going to deal with some other stuff later. I want, I want to hit you quickly on these two points. Title IX concerns. Uh, uh, most of the revenue-producing sports are men's football and men's basketball. There's always the discussion of Title IX and the equity of opportunity for female and male athletes. The opportunity is available because this is for all sports. Are you worried that if there's an imbalance where a lot of the money goes to those two sports, men's football and men's basketball, that there could be Title IX questions raised about this proposed change in legislation? Yeah, I, of course I am. And, and so was the entire Board of Governors who ultimately approved this. One of the principles that they, that they made really clear was the need to, to 
make sure that however we put this together in the coming months, that issues of, of uh, diversity, inclusion, and equity are, are carefully uh, uh, considered and balanced. Uh, obviously, the high-profile sports of football and men's basketball are where you would expect to see uh, people who want to do sponsorship deals, marketing deals, are going to have the, the biggest impact. That's, that's clear. Uh, but, you know, you see that today, and that's that's not a surprise when you look at the revenue that flows into those sports and coaches' salaries and a variety of other things that are made available to those sports. The question, again, is, as you point out, is one of opportunity and access. How do we make sure that, that those opportunities and that access are provided in a, as equitable a way as possible? That's going to be tricky, no, no doubt about it, but you know, I, I think there's a way to make that work. I'm, I'm actually more worried about potential impact uh, of, the, of the virus, which maybe we'll talk about later, on, on schools' budgets yes. uh, and what that's going to mean. Well, you've led us to a break, so we'll do that. We'll tease that. We'll come <laughs> back. We'll talk about COVID-19's impact and the NCAA tournament and spring sports and eligibility and the other 800 things that I could ask Mark Emmert about. Dr. Emmert, the president of the NCAA, rejoins us as we continue on Lunch Talk Live. And tonight, we continue with the president of the NCAA, Dr. Mark Emmert. And obviously, COVID-19 had a huge impact. You mentioned the NCAA tournament being canceled, all the spring sports being canceled. What does that budget shortfall for not having the NCAA tournament mean for the member institutions? Well, obviously, nothing good. You know, th there's a lot of confusion about uh, out there about what the NCAA budget looks like, the the fact is that the NCAA generates revenue only from its official championships, and the only one that generates any consequential revenue uh, in that sense is the men's basketball tournament. In round numbers, around a billion dollars, uh, the vast majority of that, over 60 percent, 600 million, immediately goes out to the schools in Division I. It's just a, a pass-through. The rest goes to run all the other 89 championships and a variety of other things. But uh, that, that distribution had to be cut really dramatically. And, and so the schools and the conferences are, are dealing with a smaller distribution coming from the basketball tournament. We had some revenue that we distributed, but it's obviously much smaller. All of the other events that we're doing have seen uh, pretty dramatic cuts as well. And, and so we're, you know, we're working on a shoestring just like most everybody is today. The drill down there was eligibility for the sports or for the athletes who were in the spring sports was rolled over. In other words, if you were a senior this year playing lacrosse, baseball, softball, tennis, you can come back and have that senior year again. I haven't seen a definitive answer on this, Mark. What happens to the juniors, sophomores, and freshmen who play those spring sports? Do they retain the year of eligibility from this year? Yeah, no, they won't. Uh, that was a lot, as, as you can imagine, a lot of debate and discussion about it. Uh, but the decision of the in Division One, for example, the Division One Council concluded that uh, that that it made great sense to let the seniors have another another shot at it. The decisions around their individual scholarships will be up to the schools. There wasn't a mandate because some schools have different resources. That makes sense. Uh, individual programs, if you think about it, Mike, it, you know, you're going to have a team that's bringing in some really uh, great freshman that they thought maybe is going to play. Well, now that the senior that that person was going to replace, he may come back or she may come back. And mm -hmm. so it's going to create some compression. And, and they realize they could only cope with that um, one year at a time rather than having that get played out over three or four years was just too tough logistically and so they concluded, look, we're going to have to provide this one-shot opportunity and then move on from there. And I think it was a very wise decision uh, and disappointing, of course, for a lot of kids. And, you know, when we called off the, the basketball tournament, most teams had finished most of their season. But, you know, to rip away the basketball tournament or the Frozen Four or any of that, I mean, that was just gut-wrenching for everybody. And I know it was for you, and there was a great TikTok on the hour-by-hour -hour decisions that you all had to come to. Brian Hainline, the chief medical officer for the NCAA, has been uh, a leader in this space. He was telling institutions and all of you in January, this was coming and we better be prepared for it. So what are the conversations now, Dr. Emmert, about football 
and all of the fall sports. What are you guys sharing with the institutions? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. We've been having lots of conversations, of course, with conferences and individual uh, schools, including our board meetings of the past two days. Uh, it, it's going to be uh, very unpredictable. Uh, we're, we're relying on, as everybody has to, the federal, state, and local health officials. Uh, that means that this could, could be very different across different parts of the country. You could see some states, even some communities saying, we're ready to play, we're ready to go and bring fans back, and other parts of the country saying, no, not yet here. And that may be based on really good medical advice. Uh, we're focusing our efforts right now on trying to, to determine what's the best model to bring students back, student athletes back, and get them re-socialized, get them uh, their training level and their fitness level up to where they can recompete, re-engage, you know, safely. So if you just think about football, uh, football athletes normally would have practiced all spring. They would have been, gone through spring conditioning, which is often the most rigorous conditioning. They would have stayed in a high level of fitness through the summer. Many of them stay on campus through the whole year. And, and then in July, they'd go mm -hmm. back into, into camp. We don't know that most of that's not occurred now. And we're not sure that we're going to be able to bring schools are going to be able to bring young men and young women because soccer comes in then too. Uh, back in late July, like would normally happen. So before you start the first football game, whenever that is, how much time in advance do you need to make sure that the, that the young men can get uh, physically fit and prepared enough that they can step onto the field and play ball safely? Now, we're trying to get that established right now. Uh, Dr. Hainline and a whole bunch of other people, football oversight committees and all those folks are talking about it uh, today. In fact, there's a bunch of meetings going on. And then we're going to keep working with uh, federal government, state governments, the conferences to determine if and when uh, schools can be reengaged in in sport. The biggest variable here isn't when is it when is it okay to play a game. It's when can schools reopen? Again, you know we're not the NFL or the or Major League Baseball. This isn't just about when can you get kids back together again, it's when is there a school open? So if a school's still closed down, uh, it's pretty hard to say, yeah, but we're gonna, bring, we're gonna bring athletes back even though we don't think it's safe for the rest of the student body. The big variable right. is, are schools gonna be able to open? And, and a quick answer here, because there's no playoff in college football that is run by the NCAA, the conferences kind of do that in football on their own. That's why all the football money is not part of the NCAA big pile. How much power does right. the NCAA have in terms of saying, hey, we all have to do this together or none of us do it? The conferences could go out and be bifurcated and some play and some not be ready to play. Yeah, I think that's frankly likely to occur. So uh, the NCAA rules specify mm -hmm. briefly <laughs> when a season can begin and when it can end and also how many games you got to play to be eligible for a championship or a bowl game. Uh, we're going to have to be ready to be really flexible uh, around all that. We're going to have to temporarily deregulate a whole variety of things just to allow students to have a, a good athletic and academic experience and also stay healthy. But, you know, when the CFP plays and, and, and what that looks like and how it's formatted, that's not an NCAA issue. Most people think it is. It's not. It's just those 10 school, 10 conferences. G League uh, has started this pathway program where some high school players are going right there bypassing college basketball. What's your concern about the future of that sport? Well, first of all, I've been an advocate for 10 years now that the NBA ought to uh, eliminate their 19-year-old rule for and one year on a high school for draft. I think it's perfectly appropriate that they take kids out of high school and this move on the G League uh, seems to reinforce that. Uh, that's not a decision of ours. That's theirs with their, their union's negotiation. I get that. But I think young men ought to have a choice. If they want to go off and immediately become a, a professional player rather than go to college, good for them. They can, today they can go to Europe, they can go to the G League, they can go to Australia, they can sit down a year. That, that's fine. If they want to come to college and they want to play in college, it's a, it's a great experience. They're going to get world-class coaching. They're going to get to play on, on one of the biggest stages 
uh, in the world, and, and we want them to want that experience. If they want to do something else like a golfer or a tennis player or a baseball player, great, go do it. Uh, that, I don't think that's going to hurt uh, call it the, the attraction and the excitement around college basketball at all. I think, indeed, it could, could improve the quality of those games uh, in a lot of ways. I, I, I'd, be, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to give them to you, too. And I've got plenty of thoughts on that, student-athletes, <laughs> how you can keep under one umbrella a half million, a half million student-athletes, 1,100 institutions, and have one set of rules. And uh, we, we will do that at, at the next time. Uh, how about we, uh, we connect for a podcast at some point? We'll talk a little bit more about yeah, uh, intercollegiate that. athletics fun. and where it's going. You bet. Yeah. Dr. Emmert, thank you. I always, call, I always call him Dr. Emmert because... The doctorate came from the Maxwell School at Syracuse University, so that's why doctor is always the the way I introduce Mark. Thank you for your time. Stay safe and really appreciate that. Yeah, exactly. I appreciate you being with us. Thanks, Mike. My pleasure. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.